the moment when we build these things, we put in basically a whole bunch of uh, the defect in item that we use as a qubit. We put a ton of it in. And then when we build those disks, um, each disk will have two or three at the edge of the disk. And so then we just pick one and say, okay, let's look at this one and see if it works. Um, and then we go through and, and try several of these devices. So you're right though, in the future, when I actually build a big computer, I'm gonna need to know, okay, in this, you know, these four disks, I have qubits that work, and then over here I've got another three disks with qubits that work, and then I've got some sort of switch that will connect them together. Um, so yeah, that's, that's another tool that I will, another block that I'll need to put in my Lego kit. TDD. Basically, TDD. So I have a question for Gary Rivka. Um, so how do we know the purpose for dark matter if we can't detect it with any of our senses and we can only know of its presence with specific frequencies? Uh, so we know about it from the motion of stars and galaxies and galaxies about each other. It's probably a better question for you, actually. <laughs> is, is, I, I, <laughs> yeah, is, is, I, I'm looking for it in the lab and that's the stuff we, we can't do yet. Uh, here, let Sarah talk about it. <laughs> 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 Just a question about real things? I got you. Yeah. <laughs> 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 um, so with, with dark matter, so with dark energy, we definitely know nothing about. Mostly that in a corner. Dark matter is pretty cool because, as Bria mentioned, we need it to explain many different kinds of observations. So one of the observations we had is this idea that when galaxies are spinning, we should be able to predict, as you go further and further out, how fast the stars are moving. That has to do with the mass of the galaxy. Almost every galaxy that we measure, the visible matter, it's just not enough. Now, interestingly, there actually was a paper that came out just this week, and there's been some back and forth, but there's a galaxy we might have found without dark matter. So it used to be that we thought dark matter was wild, but now we might have detected it through its absence, which is weird. We also can see it get left behind. So when you take big things and merge them, like galaxies or clusters of galaxies, we can measure those galaxies in different ways. We might count the stars, we might look at the hot gas, but we can also measure the gravity that gets exerted on everything around it. When we look at the gravity, we're missing mass again. So we have different ways, different systems that we're able to look at and when we try to count up the mass, the way that we usually understand gravity to work, we just can't find enough stuff. And we've tried different solutions. So one of the cool things about physics, which is probably not how it works, but it's still a possibility, is that actually we're getting our physics wrong. It's not that we're missing particles. We could be getting our physics wrong. So maybe there's a different solution. So there are still people looking for other solutions, not just particles. Although in general, the physics community has come around. So we make lots of different measurements of objects in space, and then eventually we have to turn to theorists and particle physicists and we say, look, we can't find anything that works with everything we know now, we need some new explanations. So then we end up with big labs tuning things up and down because we just don't have enough constraints. From this side now. I have a question for Joy Key. Um, so during your talk, it sounded like the gravity waves hit Earth before the light waves did. Does that mean gravity waves would be faster than the speed of light? Excellent question. <laughs> uh, uh, as far as we can measure, gravitational waves travel at the speed of light. Uh, you're right with the neutron star merger, uh, the gravitational waves from their in spiral uh, hit the Earth uh, before the gamma ray burst. Um, that's because the gamma rays were created after the merger, uh, but they were all traveling at the speed of light through the universe towards us um, to hit us. Thank you. Hey there, uh, thanks a lot, first of all. Um, second of all, some of us have kids here that are sort of pre-college age, and I thought maybe a couple of you could tell us what you thought you know, if you're interested in hard sciences, maybe you're interested in physics, you're a high school kid or a middle school kid, what, what would you recommend those kids do? <laughs> no, one, no one wants to answer. Uh, take lots of science and math classes. 
Uh, but do stuff that, find stuff you're interested in. That's the real answer. Uh, do stuff that you like to do. Uh, there's lots of work to be done, and we need lots of people to do that work. Uh, and so figure out what you like to do, and uh, learn as much as you can about it. Uh, and uh, you'll really get to explore once you're in college. Uh, so find something you're interested in. Uh, I will also say, um, and this is not advice parents want to hear, but I have an 11 year old, so I feel totally legit and ruining everyone's life here. Um, yeah, go outside in the world. Because actually I think the things that I have benefited from the most, I've had lots of wonderful classes and wonderful mentors and research experience, um, but a lot of things when you're working on kind of the cutting edge of physics is incorporating a lot of other experiences you might have had when there's not directions for how to solve problems. And one of kind of the biggest moments when you start doing research is that moment when you go to ask someone how to do something and everyone's like, I don't know. I guess you have to go figure it out. And you're like, oh, I cannot Google this. I'm gonna have to work it out. And so I think the more experience you have kind of doing different things that you find interesting, not even necessarily inside the classroom, allows you to have a deeper experience there. All right, so you carry all of that with you when you start to come into the classroom. And I think that, or into the lab, and I think that that's one of the things Kanye was talking about was, you know, the more of us that have all sorts of experiences in the world, bringing it to physics, we come up with interesting solutions, right? We don't know a lot about how the universe works, and so we want your brains that are all filled up with wild and crazy things to come and take some stabs at things, right? That's how we end up with quantum computers. Um, it's, you know, that's how we find gravitational waves, which frankly, people thought of as like a joke for a really long time, right? Like now it's like, oh cool, multi-messenger astronomy, like that's what you should write your postdoc application about. Like 20 years ago, people were like, why are you wasting your time? That's impossible and not happening, right? Like someone said they did it and everyone just wrote it off. So there's a lot of really powerful stuff out there that comes from your imagination and experience. I just wanna add something for the shy people in the room, because I tend to actually be shy. Um, <laughs> uh, don't be afraid to ask questions, because there was a lot of time when I was studying physics um, in high school and in college, and even a lot in graduate school, in fact, where I was worried that I was supposed to already understand something, and so maybe I shouldn't ask the question, because then I'll like be the person who doesn't know. But in fact, uh, you won't learn that way. And oftentimes when I talked about those questions after the fact, I found that, that my classmates didn't know them either. So I just want to encourage everybody to like always ask lots of questions and never feel shy about doing that. OK, we have time for one or two more. <laughs> I have a question for Gray. Um, so I'm thinking, um, what are the chances to find the right frequency? And since you mentioned there's a very large range of frequencies, so like, how do you um, how how do you narrow down the range, and how do you like um, target this certain frequency um, to test for? Okay, that's a really big question. Um, try to stay away from the plots that have like the predictions. And it's because the question of, of you know, how long till we find it with our current experimental program is actually, it's a theological question. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you're imagining some, some creation myth, and there is someone, something, and it's throwing darts at the, the frequency scale. And this, this is kind of a physicist joke, apologies. Uh, and, and it really matters whether the, the, it's on a linear or a log scale axis. <laughs> um, so I can say that 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 uh, over the next like five years we are covering a significant fraction of the kind of best most favored range, um, and so the odds are good, but I, it's very very hard for me to put a number on it. The range comes from oh god the, the range comes from so you take everything you know about physics and cosmology, and you plug in a particular frequency which corresponds to a particular mass of a dark matter particle. And you say, does this give me the right amount of dark matter that I see in measurements today? 
And if it does, then you say, okay, that's a good one, you should look there. And if it does not, then you say, that's probably wrong. Uh, the problem is that there's a great deal of uncertainty on that, and that's why you get a, a, a huge error bars, because it kind of requires you getting everything right um, since the beginning of time to now. You know, <laughs> We're surprisingly, we're, we're better than you think. <laughs> which is, which is, yeah, which is, I, I, well, I, I think they have very low bars, so. <laughs> okay, we have time for one more question. <coughs> um, how did you capture the sound of the black holes colliding if there aren't a lot of good ways for sound to travel through space? Ah, very good question. That is right. Uh, the, the way that our ears work when we hear sound is from air vibrating, uh, and there is no air in space, uh, so sound doesn't travel in space. Uh, but the LIGO detectors, uh, the, the data, uh, we can actually, so there you saw those sort of wiggles um, when we heard the sound. Uh, you can actually make speakers uh, vibrate with those same wiggles. So we can put those those waveforms or those wiggles onto speakers and shake the speakers and our ears can hear that. So that's right. If you were, if you were out in, in space, you would not hear the gravitational waves, um, but, but LIGO can hear the gravitational waves. They are like our ears. The votes are coming in. You have exactly one more minute to get your votes. 